What you're about to witness is a straight up raw interview. This isn't my normal style, but I was on the fly at the Lehigh Valley Tattoo Expo, and I had an opportunity to interview Shane Enholm. Shane is a tattoo artist, musician, author, and painter, and a bank robber as well. And you're about to hear a good portion of his story today as he describes his life as he got the start, how it was interrupted with a long prison stay, and how he got circled back into the community and began to do what he loves to do. He collects machines and he's written a book or two about it. We tried to leave the audio as unedited as possible and I tried to fix the audio to clean up the background noise as best as I could. I really wanted this to be as raw as I could possibly get it so you could feel the emotion and see the emotion on Shane's face as he tells his story. Now listen, you guys out in camera land, these are my opinions, not these guys. So if I say something you just don't like, it's me, not them. I just want to make that clear because sometimes I can get pretty greasy. So I don't want anybody blaming them for my opinions. When did you start tattooing? I did my first tattoo on myself in, in group home when I was 12 years old. It's still here, this Aries symbol. Okay. Um, what happened was I was a kid and when they first put me in the group home, there was a guy at the dinner table and he had a heart tattooed on his, a black heart, like hand-picked. Thank you, thank you, thank you, hand-picked. So then they were like, hey, I go, what is that? They're like, it's a tattoo, we'll show you how to do them after dinner. And then they taught me how to hand poke. Now, later, when I ran away and you know, all that, I ended up, in Long Beach, I, there was a place called Nordic Conquest, and it was me, Steve Human Fowder, an animal, Kenneth Wayne Sneed, animal boner. That was his nickname in punk rock. Famous, infamous punk rock guys, and we lived very close to the pipe. So we went down to the pipe and got tattooed down there. First thing I ever got, Bob Shaw did it. And it wasn't on purpose, like this hot stuff here, because it's a cover-up. I had, in Juvenile Hall, tattooed Led Zepp right there. But you know, a punk rock kid can't have Led Zepp. So what happened was when we went in there, 35 bucks, he, I was talking to the guy that was gonna do it, or maybe it was Jane, the girl, and he said, I'll do it. And he, he did it. And that was me, they liked us. Yeah. That was the beginning. And the only places open late at night were tattoo shops. I was a homeless kid from the time I was 12 years old. On. So I used to go down there and sweep up for a burger or anything they'd given me. And that's how my tattoo career started. Of course, it didn't last long because I was a drug addict and they don't like drug addicts. So I did it for a while, but I ended up uh, going to prison for bank robberies. Um, and then when, and the only person that wrote me while I was in prison was Mark Mahoney, who I had met on the pike in 83. He's my oldest friend in tattooing. He had come from the East Coast and he put a bunch of beautiful tattoos on me, single needle. He was so good. He was taken, now I know where, he, he got this from Ronnie's in Rhode Island. Because he texts me and he goes, hey man, if you're going to Rhode Island, go to Ronnie's. He drew a tattoo on me with a ballpoint pen watching Johnny Carson and did it perfect. Wow. And when I was there, Mark would take a, a set five by seven card and he would draw the tattoo on it, show it to you, and then tattoo it on you. And he was good. I have some beautiful Mark Mahoney's tattoos. So well, you, you said you started doing your own stuff uh, in the, the home or whatever, but did you, would you do official apprenticeship? Not really. No. Nah. Well, yeah, but an official apprenticeship wasn't like it what it is today. In. Yeah. And they'll show you how to do them. Okay. And, you know, they wanted you tattooing as soon as possible. So they kind of show you how to do some machines and then go. But as far as an official, take the trash out, do all that shit, that wasn't happening. That's, that's funny because a lot of motherfuckers that do that, they, they, they put someone through changes and they never went through them. Mm. They make it really hard. 
oh, I was walking uphill both ways. And I know those guys, and I know they didn't do that. Right. I know their mom paid Malone, or I know their, you know, I know every, and so I, it's like bullshit. Right. Why are they doing that? You know what I mean? I understand you want to see if the guy's worthy. I get that. But some of these guys, it's ridiculous. And they didn't, if that's what you went through, and that's how you learn, then yes, by all means, teach someone the same way. But if that's not what you went through, then why the fuck are you doing that? Just to be a... Yeah, it makes sense, dude. If you're not gonna, you're not willing to do it yourself, then don't put somebody else through it. Well, the guy that really taught me to tattoo was a guy named John Sandler. His nickname was Horse. And in 77, Ed and Malone, there was a convention, I want to say Reno, but could have been Sacramento, but it's, I'm pretty sure it's Reno. Ed and Malone, they made this booth that was like a circus or a, you know, and they they had little like red striped and a little, you know what I mean? And Charlie and Jack, good time Charlie and all the single needle guys went up there. They'd never seen it before. Prison work. And they were blown away by it. So Ed opened a shop in, in the mission and John Sandler was in San Quentin and Ed got him out of San Quentin. He was in the camp by that time. And Ed got him out of San Quentin to work at there with Bob. Bob was there and Katie was there and Chuck Eldridge was there and that chick. There's a chick that had the PR. Her husband helped Paul cast, I'll think of her name. She, was, she wasn't really good at tattooing because she tried to do like oil paintings instead of tattooing, you know. There's a way if you don't follow, you know, I'll think of her name. Anyway, I met Horse down on the pike. And he'd been fired from there and I liked him and I looked up to him and, and then he got busted for bank robbery. Then I got busted for bank robbery and we were sellies in Terminal Island. So he had, Bob had done a big, uh, that skull that you see that's like, looks like a, kind of like a Mongol skull. It's not a Mong, but it looks like one. Bob had done that on his neck. And so Horace and me were cellies, and that's where I really got into black and gray tattooing. Okay. So Horace got out before I did, and I heard when he was out, he went by and saw Bob. Bob gave him some money, and he was driving up in the hills, him and his girlfriend, and they got pulled over, and a cop shot him in the head, and he lived. And it's just like, if there was a guy that steps in horse shit, it's him. Like, they could be this whole area and one little turd there and horse is gonna step in. That's just him. Sweetheart of a guy, as Bob would say, a gentle soul. He's from Palos Verdes, he's from a good family. And there was a tattoo in Good Time Charlie's in Anaheim, or maybe it was East LA. In the back room, there was a sea monster that Horace had done on his old lady that they said was the best black and gray tattoo ever done. Nice. A lot of people remember it. The only fucking guy that doesn't remember it is Jack Rudy, which doesn't surprise me because it's not Jack's. Right. If it was Jack's tattoo. He'd remember every, you know. Anyway, that's the guy that, okay. So fast forward, I get out of prison. First night I was out, Mark had written me about that he got Shamrock when I was in. And first night I was out, my sister drove me to Mahoney's. He was working at a place called Mayhem. I saw him, it was kind of weird. I don't know why, but later I found out why, but, but it doesn't matter, I love Mark. So I seen him, he was the only tattooer that wrote me and sent me art or whatever. Um, and then my pro officer told me I couldn't tattoo while I was on parole, because there were dens of iniquity, so I had to get a job jackhammer and chimneys, because I'd have done anything to stay out. My, my kids, the mother of my kids is the girl that had the suicide pact with Darby Crash and the germs. She lived, he died, then I met her, and I used to defend her, and then we ended up, four years later, having Arwen, my oldest daughter, and then 86, we had Stormy, and uh, when I got caught, the FBI was like, hey man, sign these bank robbery photos. I said, I'll only sign them if you let her go with the girls. They caught us all together, and they went and had a meeting, and came back and said, okay, deal, we'll let her go. 
and they let me watch her walk out and she took the kids to a friend's house, left them on the doorstep, no one ever saw her again. Kids went into foster care. I thought she'd get a picket fence and a white house, take care of the kids. She's a dope fiend, so anyway. So when I got out, I needed to get those kids out. They were living in a house with 60 cats and foster was horrible. I mean fucking horrible, and they were being abused. So I would have done anything the parole officer said. They said I couldn't tattoo. So I tattooed at home with the tattoo with the joint rotary. I did bodies. I did bodysuit on Spider Middleman, who famous sax player. You know, different people. But um, I didn't jump back into professional tattooing until 2002, maybe. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. So you had like a 20 year. Uh... I ate it. Hiatus. Yeah, there you go. And it had changed a lot when I got yeah. back in. Mark, everybody always offered me jobs because they knew I could draw or knew I could tattoo. And I was good with customers. But I just turned them down, turned them down, turned them down. And then finally, I, w I started working it for Mario Barth in New Jersey. I was living, okay, I was living on the West Coast, had a son with this broad. She met some guy, and I'm like, I gotta get as far from here as possible. I'm gonna kill everybody, you know, seven an affair. So I went to Mario Bars, and I lasted a couple days. She's a fucking, whatever. Anyway, so then when I went back to LA, a friend of mine had been broken by Colonel Todd, Karen, and I said, can I have a job? And she said, of course, and hired me. And then I've been there for 20 years, or 22 years, or 24 years, whatever the fuck it is. Right. So I know that this was one of the things that connected you and I together. You got some clean time, how long? 20 years. Right on, bro. September 24th, 2004. Nice. You know, man, you've done that, you changed your life, you got back into it, and now you're on this tour. Tell us a little about, about this tour. My closest friend in tattooing is it was Bob Roberts. And Bob and I were very close. We did all our holidays together, his girlfriend, my girlfriend, our families, his sister. And he died May 25th, 2022. And then my closest friend in punk rock is Steve Fowder, who's the bass player of the Vandals. Started that band, Pat Brown, tried to run the cops down, Pat Brown, I know all those guys. And he died two weeks later. Now I had started, I released an album. I had written, I'm always played music. I was in this band called the Flower Leopards back in the day. There's a lot, we were on Mystic Records, which is a punk rock label. And there's a lot of songs, Preacher's Confession. Played, and uh, I always played music. So I wrote an album in prison and a guy asked me if I wanted to record it. He, he came to a party I was playing at Heard one of the songs, said, do you want to record it? I thought he was joking. His name was Michael Rose on it. I said, yeah, sure. So we recorded it, and it was all the songs from prison. It's called Divine American Pariah. So I would tour and play at the tattoo shops. Like, I went to Indiana. I met some Indiana tattooers, and uh, I would go there, and then we'd go to Kentucky. And, you know, and, and I would tattoo all day and then play. And then COVID hit, and then that killed that. I had to cancel one tour. And so during COVID, I wrote a book, Tattoo Machine Discourse. I'm a machine collector. And how that began was before prison, when the lightweight machine came out and the Colonel Todd, uh, uh, Jim Dandy, all the tattooers were throwing their machines in buckets. They didn't want them. So I'd go, hey, what are you gonna do with those machines? And they'd like, why? And I go, I want it. Why do you want that thing? I just want it. Can I have it? And they would give me their old machines. And so, so it was the only thing I had when I got out of prison, I still had some of this stuff. So I've always been fascinated with antique tattoo machines. So I started collecting them and uh, trying to figure out the history because we're a, we're a spoken word history and you're investigating to figure out the evolution of the American tattoo machine you're gonna have to you have a it's like being a homicide detective where there's no body no suspect no witnesses so it's through a preponderance of evidence so i would tour for the album tattoo and also look at old machines people had people always bring me old machines and i look at them 
the book I wrote because we were closed 11 months during COVID and I got busted twice tattooing during COVID. They waited outside the health department and busted me. And then Scott Sterling, who I'm really close with, and all these guys, Mahoney, all these guys like, Shane, you need to write a book on old machines, Shane. But I never wanted to write a manual on how to fake them because people fake, I mean, it's money in it, you know? And there's certain things to tell what, what a Jonesy is. Or, anyway, so I wrote the book and, yeah. and then um, COVID, we sold it. And then I was going to go on tour again, and I didn't go. I did a couple small jaunts, but I always needed to go on tour again. And I wrote the second book, Tattoo Machine Discourse, Volume 2. And that's why I went on tour this time, okay. to promote the books. And I've played at a couple places, but mostly I'm just tattooing. Yeah, well, I mean, everywhere I've seen you so far, you've been pretty goddamn busy tattooing. So uh, looks like it's... Uh, yeah, well, they're all blind. <laughs> glasses maybe they wouldn't get them but that's not true but you know the thing about tattooing today is there are many excellent tattooers their application is flawless way more than in the 80s the 90s and all that shit but i don't think that matters anymore because everyone's like well it's tattooing and i go yeah and him and a thousand other guys but to me getting a tattoo is an experience you know to me, what these guys get wrong is when Burt Grimm says world famous Burt Grimm's, it's not that Burt Grimm's world famous, though he does come off like that, is he wants the customer, you found it, this is the spot, you are at the most famous tattoo, you dig what I'm saying? These guys, they all think that that means them. And the truth is, of course Burt Grimm's world famous, of course Sailor Jerry, but why they do that is for the customer. This is it, this is the spot, you're here. And then, you know, I think that's lost on a lot of tattooers. They think fucking they're Yoda because they can fucking put up a, a Pharaoh's horses or, a, and they're not. There's a million guys that can do it. I used to say the dumber you are, the better you can tattoo. Cause you don't question it. You know, when Bob was teaching me to paint, Bob Roberts taught me how to paint. And I would ask him why when we were doing something. Well, don't ask why, just do it. I think that smarts get in the way. Not always, but so I think that um, what, what's happened to us as a whole, I think another thing that's happened to us is that somebody, especially with machine building, they build a machine and then someone does the same thing as them. And all of a sudden you're like, what the fuck? That's my fucking whatever. And the truth is, yeah, where'd you steal it from? Maybe they thought it up, maybe. But the truth is, is that we're human beings and I always say it's like the pyramids. I don't think UFOs made the pyramids. I think that maybe the Egyptian pyramid was a power station. But I think that human beings come up with the same designs simultaneously, one in New Jersey, one in California. It isn't that this guy saw this guy's shit and stole it. It's that they both look at the problem and they go, oh, I'll make it like this. That's what I think. But, you know, it's not, it's lost to us. I also don't think that historians, most tattoo historians are assholes. Because um, of their egos, okay? And the older ones don't want to say they don't know. I like saying I don't know. Socrates was the smartest man in Athens because he knew that he did not know. So it leaves his mind open to learn. But these guys, when you ask them, hey man, why is this like this? Why? They're like, oh, well, that's because and they make some shit up that's totally wrong because they don't want to be known as not knowing. And, and I think that's done us a big disservice. I think another thing that we do wrong as historians, is, especially machines, is we use the patents as markers and they're bullshit. Whoever, are you out of your mind? Do you really think a guy made a tattoo machine and then the day after he made it, he went and got a patent? No way. It took years and years and years before those patents came into being. I think the the electromagnetic device came together in 1830s, the, the doorbell in 1850s. So the tap, electro tattoo machine 
I would say that's 1870s, not 1890s. And I don't think anyone ever tattooed with an O'Reilly machine. Says no model presented or something. Lyle well, taught me that in in the original. They might have whited it out on some of them, but in the original patent it says, and it's got an elbow in the tube. Show me how the fuck that's gonna work. Maybe the elbow big enough you could have an elbow and then it would go. You dig what I'm saying and be okay. But the truth is, a tattoo machine should go the tube straight. So all these guys have Edison pins, but they don't have O'Reilly's. Anyway, so I think they were tattooing with electric machines probably the late 1860s, after the Civil War, 1870s. Also, there was a guy in the Brooklyn Eagle, that newspaper, who saw a dental plunger that, that is this thing looks like a tattoo machine, kind of, that they chip plaque off, you know? And he said that would make a good electric tattoo machine. He's a fucking reporter. They get everything last. Oh, what, he's fucking privy to that? No, nah, they were around. People just didn't know it. And also, tattooing wasn't popular. You know, when the tattooer died, they would just throw his shit out. Nobody was like, oh, I want all his stuff. They never knew the flash would be worth any. So a lot of our history is lost to the dump. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I will never say that I'm an expert by any means, and I will also always admit when I'm wrong or not not right. right. I don't know just because of what you just said. You know, and this is why I appreciate people like you that are, are willing to sit down and talk and, and, and give it straight, man, you know? Yeah, well, this is just my opinions, but but patents? No way. They're fuck no way. No fucking way. Tattooing is a secret. It's a magic trick. First thing a magician does, don't reveal your secrets. So somebody's doing electric tattooing. Do you know how amazing that probably was back then? Fucking what? Newfangled electric tattooing. Oh, I want one. His hand poking an Indian head. Whatever. Think how fast they could do it with an electric. I mean, oh my God. So I think that somebody thought if I could patent it, Maybe I could corner the market, just like they're doing now. Right. It's the same shit over and over and over. Am I right? I don't know. But I'll give you an idea. Okay. And I like Lyle. He's dead. God bless him. He's funny as hell. And, you know, I mean, the guy's 80-something years old. He can get an 18-year-old girl to blow him. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> Has a book filled with naked girls he's showing me that he took pictures of. It's pretty amazing. So his theory on the swing gate, and he's wrong, is that he, Bob Shaw's tattooing somebody and the machine breaks. How the fuck does a vice break when you're tattooing? It's not gonna break. It's the tubes, they don't even change the tubes. You're tattooing. How's a vice gonna break? A vice is break when you're changing tubes. Okay, let's say one did. Bob Shaw never gave a non-tattooer. That guy treated the machine like the atom bomb. He's not gonna give some, they say he's tattooing an engineer and it broke and he goes, hey, can you fix this? And the engineer goes home. The truth is Lou Lewis invented the swing gate. Lou Lewis was a tattooer, Lou Lewis and Ernie Sutton. In the daytime, Lou Lewis, and at night, Lou Lewis and Zeke Owen tattooed at Burt Grimm's and in the day, Bob Shaw and Burt Grimm. And the health department came in 1964 and said, hey, man, you guys are going to have to change your tubes. Lou went home, invented the swing game. Now, Lyle would have done himself a justice if he would have just said, I don't fucking know. God bless him, but he's wrong about it. I mean, the reason I know that is because Lou Lewis's kid is Rio de Janeiro, and I'm not the only one. Carmen will tell you this. It's been, we found this out, but that's tattoo history for you. You know, I think egos are involved and nobody wants to admit they're wrong. You know, it ain't my fucking history. It's just my idea. You know what I mean? I hope that, that makes sense. What do you think could happen to bridge the gap between the old school guys and the newer artists? Get rid of us, the old guys. Hmm. Especially, they're, they're trying to make coils illegal. That, that, that whole 
in the, I don't know, omnibus bill last summer, page 2000, they pass it. Everything's going to have to be FDA approved. Painful Pleasures and Nexus own Bishop Rotary. They, they bought, these corporations have bought this and they're lobbying the government. They're going to say that coil machines aren't sanitary. And I don't think that they're going to say it because it's true. I think they're going to say it because they don't want us in the way. They want to have all these little 18-year-old trained pen-using motherfuckers. And I don't knock anyone. You want to use a pen, use a pen. Me? They aren't sexy enough for me. I'll never fucking use one. It's like the difference between a 1950 Chevy truck with a whoop oak bed and a fucking... Tesla, I'll never fucking, never, I'm done. Once that happens, I'm done. Do you have any advice for somebody that wants to get into the business now? Run. <laughs> Run? Uh, well, you know, I, you know, I don't know, but you know what's sad about it is that once upon a time, art school would never suggest to be a tattooer. Never. Never, it was a folk art, da, 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 you know. Now they tell them to be art because, because, buddy, high signed how much money they're making. You know, he used to walk into Bob Shaw's shop or one of them guys, and and they're busy, kind of, and you go, how's it going, man? Ah, we're getting by. And then you'd notice he had a Rolex or out the front, there'd be a Cadillac, but he never fucking copped to it because he didn't want you up. You know what I'm saying? Right. So these motherfuckers here, I've been in fights with some of them. Epic watches of tattooing. And that's Murray, and I like Murray, but what are you doing, pal? You, three things are gonna happen. Someone's gonna rob you, which someone got killed over a Rolex in Oakland. Someone walked in the shop and shot him. The tax IRS is gonna come. Or some 17-year-old kid's going to say, I want to do it too, and open up. Then you got this guy, the whatever scratcher, he's a blonde guy on with the scrubs. Have you seen this guy on the internet? Nah. He's going around the shop going, how much did you make? Guy's like, 900 bucks. How much did you make? You know what I mean? And what he's doing is because no one would let him in, he's going opposite. No one would let me in. So during COVID, I taught myself. And now he's giving lessons online. And he's saying things like that. Saying, you know, what they say is these gatekeepers are old bikers on speed, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I never seen that. There might be a couple. But I see, to me, an older tattooer is a tinted glass, frameless glasses guy with a fucking feathered haircut and boot cut pants with a silk shirt with a mint piece of gum you know what I mean he ain't a dope feet you know but they want to say that because they kept these guys out and now now it's a bit it's over it's everywhere and everyone just wants to cash in and they don't give a fuck who they hurt who came before them who they don't care and so a young tattooer well I don't know find the right person to teach you it's the only thing that's going to save us. You know, I could say, fuck that. I'm not teaching anyone. They can go to hell and blah, blah, blah. But there's enough young people that want to know the way we do things that they could help us. There's a bunch that don't, too. But Stories from people like yourself and whatnot that, that could help. Well, the other thing is, okay, so now, now they're knocking them out with anesthesia, right? That's what they're doing, right? Okay. That's stolen valor. Because if they... This is a rite of passage. You sit down, you get fucking tattooed. It fucking hurts. It hurts. It hurts. That's part of it. You can't take it away. You know, so, but then you went through it. You know, the guy got, the guy was going to war. He got out of boot camp. He wants his devil dog. He fucking gets it. He goes to Fallujah. He comes back. He wants Fallujah. You don't fucking knock him out. And he gets it without any pain. Fuck that. It, it's a, and it's folk art. The minute that you take us out of it, AI and the, I don't mind, a lot of people use those pads. God bless them, it makes their job easier. 
But when you have a program that shows scales, you know, you just hit a thing or a chain, and then, then you're taking the human element out of it. And this is a human art. And I, I, you're, anyone's going to get tattooed by me, they're going to get a Shane tattoo. But it might not be as great as some of these guys, right. but it's fucking real. What still gets you excited about tattooing? All, all of it does. When, there, when I'm around people, this tour has been really good for me. Because um, I get to meet people that still care, you know, about it. There are people, you guys, there's people, it, it's good. Because I can sit at home and get real jaded with Instagram, you know. And, and I can talk shit and I do. But, but when you get out into the field... And, and start putting tattoos on and people love them. You know, you know, people used to say to me, okay, I work at Ink Smith and Rogers for a long time. And I'd go out there and work and I'd do a tattoo and fucking a couple of them be like, man, Shane, that thing, man, you really like hammer, they're like red and sore, you know what I mean? And I'd be like, yeah, man. And then five years later, they'd go, man, that tattoo came out, with great. No shit, motherfucker. But oh, he's like, well, I don't do that. Mine are, you know, I think a lot of people do a tattoo for the photo. Ah. Instantly. Yeah. And I think that really you should be doing the tattoo for the customer so that in five and ten years it looks good. Right. You know what I mean? And and I think that's lost on a lot of people. What a lot of people have been saying on this tour is, Jesus, Shane, you don't hurt when you tattoo. That comes from learning in the 80s. In the 80s, like, okay, I sell Paul Roger machines. First thing somebody says, how's it run? And I'm like, like, shit. Because it's different now than tattooing then. They're doing wizards with fucking all these little hairs, and pussy hairs, and whatever they're doing. They don't do that now. But when I tattoo someone, they're always like, man, you don't really hurt. Because then it was all about trauma to the skin. Don't, it skin's the biggest organ of your body. When you tattoo, it's trauma. So we were taught not to hurt it. A lot of these kids, they, I, people say to me all the time, oh my God, it was the most painful tattoo I've ever been tattooed. I'm like, oh my God, it hurts so bad. And I'm like thinking, yeah, because they're more concerned with getting a picture of the whip shade or whatever now than they are with letting it heal and getting a picture in a year or two. Well, I mean, I think that social media, besides our channel, of course, is going to be the downfall of, you know. Yeah, but, okay, and you're right. And and, and they canceled me. I had 27,000 followers, and they took me down because I talk a lot of shit. I go on there and go. It's my fucking channel. What I don't understand is this. Some guy goes on there and talks shit to me, right? I don't go on his page and talk shit to him. The fuck you coming on my page for? You got a problem with the world? Do a video about it. Go get your own followers and do it. Why are you coming on my page? It, it, a lot of them, I'm like, have you? Have I ever come on your stupid fucking page and said what a moron you are? Then why do you come on mine? But you know how they say social credit? If you heard all these things, yeah. Social, yeah, well, it is. Instagram is social credit because if you're a tattooer and they take it from you, it's hard to earn a living. I've been there. Twenty-seven thousand followers took it. I built back up. I'm at eleven thousand something now, but I built back up. They'll never let me get. They'll never do it. They'll never do it. And then you got people that buy follow. Uh, Shane, what's your uh, what's your Instagram now? <laughs> It's Shane, my full name, Shane Enholm 3. It used to be Shane Enholm, but now it's Shane Enholm 3, and sometimes I t try to go change it back to Shane Enholm, and they won't let me. Okay. Well, I just want everybody to know, so this way they can reach out to you. Yeah. Another thing I notice, okay, most of these guys really dig like Dan Higgs. He's the man. Oh my God, Dan Higgs, Dan Higgs, okay. God bless Dan Higgs. But Jesus Christ, his music is just awful. And my friends and I go literally listen to him and think 
is he up there wanting us to go, Jesus Christ, this is awful. And he, no one does because it's like modern art. Somebody throws paint at a wall and everyone's scared to go, dude, that looks like shit. Right. Because then they aren't intelligent. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, with Higgs, I got nothing against Dan Higgs, but boy, his fucking music is just God. I mean, and then I ask another tattooer, the fuck, you like that shit? I'm like, well, you just don't understand. Oh, no, I understand. I play music. I understand. It's awful. Well, tattooing, God bless him, okay? But now he's gone from tattooing, right? Well, either be completely gone from it, but don't come back and then sell your paintings to tattooers. Either be gone from it or embrace it. But you can't have it both ways. Not in my world. You're either a tattooer or you're not. That's it. But these guys want to leave tattooing. There's other ones. That fucking uh, guy doing the pinups. I'll think of his name. He's got these weird things on his face. Uh, God damn it. He has school, you know, he does these classes on pinups. He was in Germany for a while. He's quitting tattooing. He goes on eBay or wherever, and people bid on the last tattoos he's ever going to do. He's going to be an artist now, right? They pay thousands of dollars for his tattoos. Somebody makes the last machines he's ever going to use, and then they sell them, right? The dumb shit goes out, he can't earn a living. He's tattooing again. The most important thing that all of us need to remember and me, most of all, tattooing has afforded us a beautiful life. And we should all be very grateful for it. If I didn't have tattooing, God knows where I'd be in the penitentiary, dead. Maybe I'd be sober. I don't know, Jack Hammer in some fucking place. I mean, I'm going to be 60. I mean, but the most important part of all this, no matter what, fucking, no matter who you are, no matter how cool you are, not how cool you are, is we need to remember tattooing has been very good to us and we need to leave it as good as we found it. That's the problem today. Motherfuckers step into this and they just rape it and ravage it and have no, and, and believe me, what goes around comes around. I mean, it really does. I know it for a fact. I know it. You. You only keep what you give away. And if you're giving away misery and fucking greed and that you're gonna that's what you're gonna get back. Maybe not exactly the same, but you're gonna get it get get it back. And you know, you see these genres of tattooers, these esoteric tattooers doing these esoteric tattoos. I made friends with one. And he was the most disappointing motherfucker I ever met in my life. I tried really hard with him. My girlfriend, he's no good, Shane. He's no good. She knew like that. She knew right away. Me, I'm, I'm reeling from Bob and, and Steve's death. And he was a prima donna, but he's doing these esoteric tattoos that maybe he's meditating to. And, but, but the truth is, is that's all fluff, man. All you got to be is real. The rest will follow. Just be yourself. Own it. I don't give a fuck what it is, but be good to tattooing and tattooing will be good to you. And let's leave it as good as we found it. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for taking the time out of your day, yeah, dude. Thank I'm, you it's, for interviewing me. I hope I hope you got enough. Oh, uh, uh, for sure, dude. It's uh, I know you're busy, man, and I appreciate it, dude. Thank you so much.